Welcome everybody. I'm doing the Q&A session and again I'm really happy to join you all and uh, today is going to be a lot of fun. I really know. And uh, so based on all of the excellent questions that I received yesterday, there was quite a few that I didn't get to. And one of them was, um, and actually I, th I believe it came in after I finished the uh, Q&A session, was about the apps that I've been using on my Instagram the past couple days. And what I've been using is Adobe Photoshop Mix. However, tonight, actually probably after this Q&A session, I'm going to uh, start a new series where I am going to show you a before and after of using different apps to get fine art pictures that are not real. Now, in my own ethics of street photography, for example, I don't change anything except black and white and tonal changes. However, if you're looking at creating art with your images, with your archives using apps, then there's no, what would you say, um, there's no ethical parameters because the app is indeed your canvas and the tools are your paintbrush. And I'm going to show you how I create art with apps, with various apps and uh, my iPhone. Of course, you can always do it on Android as well if you use Android. So welcome everybody. Good to see you all. And this is a Q&A session if you haven't been uh, on this before and uh, giving you guys some waves. I'm glad that you joined. Andrea B227, hi Mark. Uh, thank you for joining so much. Feel free to ask any questions. You can either uh, add them by the comment section below or the question mark. And there's a little icon, a question mark. It's easier for me to, to do it through the question mark. However, it doesn't matter. As long as I get to your questions, I am happy. Also, uh, just an FYI, there's two little happy faces, two little icons, happy faces. And that is to come on live with me if you have a question that you actually want to be live. Now, a lot of people <laughs> press that by mistake and uh, they just um, decline. That's, that's perfectly fine. But that's why those two little happy faces are down there. Okay, welcome everybody. Good to see you all. I hope you're all doing well. And um, by the way, what is the temperature like where you guys are anywhere in the world? Right now, it's actually much, much nicer than yesterday, although still very cold. That's why I'm wearing three jackets, as you can see. Um, anyway, hopefully you guys are in warmer environments. Boris Chachava, welcome. Hi, everybody. Good to see you all. Amurimi, hello. Joseph Corey, welcome, everybody. Uh, JVV Vallejo, probably. Hi, Mark. Oh, yes, of course. Good to see you. Hi, Mark. First question. What level of adjustments is ethical? Uh, really good question. So, Insta Varun, what I do in my street photography, by the way, this is no way uh, something that I think that you guys should do. You come up with your own ethics, but I'll just tell you what mine are. And first of all, I just noticed something. I just made the, the biggest rookie mistake. <laughs> what is in the composition that I'm creating of myself? Maybe you guys could throw out. This is a quiz. What is wrong with the composition that I did of myself if I was actually taking a picture, doing a selfie for promotion? I want you guys to tell me. So again, how did I compose myself really poorly right now? And I'd like to hear your answers. Write them below. Okay, back to the ethics. In my street photography, I don't change anything except black and white, tonal adjustments and cropping. However, every other genre of photography, whether it be landscapes, um, fashion, uh, what would you say, studio work, everything else, I have zero ethical constraints as to how much I alter the picture in post-processing. Uh, for commercial work, it's entirely dependent on the will and the desire of my client. However, it's for, if it's for personal work, it's entirely based on how I want the image to look. And it could be um, a radical shift, a completely shift. For example, when I, in, when I used to do a lot of studio work, I would do product photography, uh, wine bottles and so on, and I would completely rearrange the image to look 
good for my client and look good for me. Landscapes, I don't care. I change anything I want. Now, there is a big difference if you're working commercially, if you're sending your images to magazines, if you are doing any type of work that involves, uh, what would you say, photojournalism, then you have very strict guidelines and you can't do whatever you want. Okay, so I hope that helps. And by the way, I'd love for, to hear any of your parameters and feel free to write them below. So it doesn't have to be just questions. Feel free to write them below because all of us learn when we hear from each other. And actually it's starting to snow. <laughs> I'm getting some snowflakes. Hopefully you guys will enjoy them. Joseph Corey, hello. Uh, 26 Celsius here in Vienna. Wow. <laughs> That's nice. I've never been to Vienna, but close to. Ireland, 14 Celsius. Okay, well, it's still warmer than where we are. Delhi, 32 degrees. Yes, yeah, no doubt. And uh, I've only been to Bangalore, but I'd love to visit Delhi. Yusuf, welcome. In Manila, very similar to uh, Delhi, 31. 22 in Gen Geneva and 16 in Germany. Yeah, the Northern uh, Europeans, very similar actually to Canadians. Um, in Barrie, Ontario, four. Yes, it's probably, it's right about zero for me. Welcome, everybody. Emils, good to see you, my friend. Um, yeah, the tree stump behind me. So uh, Joseph is the first person to mention this. See this, uh, this post here? This is very bad, <laughs> uh, at least uh, in my mind. It's unex. Uh, I, I'm always really critical of what's behind my head or when I'm doing portraits, what's behind the person's head. And that's really good because you don't want sticks coming out of them. Now, if Instagram Live had what, what is called depth of field or background blur or uh, Apple calls it portrait mode, then it would be less of an issue. So all I have to do is just angle my camera and then we have potentially another problem where I now have a green afro. And maybe that actually looks better than ha having a bald head. I'm not sure. So what you have to do is whenever you're doing portraits, just make sure that it's not too obvious that something is sticking out of the person's head. And when you have a high depth of field like I do currently, then everything shows up in the background. And that's always, pretty much always the case for a, a, man, uh, sorry, a uh, mobile device camera, unless you are doing the artificial portrait mode background blur. Okay, uh, MSM, MSM sent a request to be in your live video. If this was a mistake, then just decline, okay? So this is a live question and answer and feel free to decline it if you don't wanna be on camera. If you do wanna be on camera, I always welcome it. Only one person has taken me up on that offer so far. Um, yes, so we will see what happens there. Um, for professional contests, says Insta Varun, besides removing or adding stuff, is it fine to really push saturation, contrast, etc.? Yeah, I don't see what's wrong with that. If the rules um, don't say anything wrong with what we call tonal adjustments or color adjustments, and tonal adjustments would usually be the alteration of shadow highlight, mid-tone, blacks and whites, and color adjustments would be vibrancy, saturation, uh, then no problem. Yeah. Do anything you want. Just make sure if you go, you don't go over the top. So that's one thing to always be considered of your viewers is that what, what is probably really cool for you may not, may be a bit, a bit over the top for the client or sorry, or for the viewer. So yeah, just, uh, don't go too over the, over the top, but yeah, do anything you want. Again, I only have one parameter, one ethical parameter when it comes to editing, and it's only based on street photography. Everything else I edit any way that I want. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Glad to see you. Molly Sarah Lou, what are some places you submit your travel photography? So I don't... Uh, with regards to stock photography, if that's what you're referring to, um, stock photography doesn't make much money these days. And it's a shame. And uh, I place the blame on Getty, the biggest stock agency in the world, uh, as they introduced micro stock, micro stock photography. Or maybe they didn't introduce it, but they bought the first micro stock agency where they would sell images for a dollar. 
And that pretty much ruined any ability for most photographers to make a decent amount of money selling stock photography. Now, as a hobby, you can certainly make money in stock photography. Uh, it's not a huge amount. All you have to do is time yourself. And what I do is on my Apple Watch, but and you know any phone would allow for this, is that you get a a timer, a business timer that allows you to put down like every time you work for a client or every time that you put time into stock photography, that would be preparing your photos, doing the keywords, uploading. You record that time and then you balance that. You figure out how much money am I getting in return based on the time I put into uploading to stock agencies. And then you'll be able to see how much money you're making per hour. And I've done this in the past and I've realized, you know what, I'm making less than minimum wage based on how much money I'm getting in return and how much money or how much time I'm putting into uploading and keywording and describing all of these photos. Now if you have an assistant then that's great but then you, you of course you, you would be the, it'd be the same thing you'd be calculating how much you pay that assistant and how much money is coming back and usually it's not worth it at least for a professional photographer. However, if you are referring to submitting your travel photography for contests, then there's contests everywhere. In fact, there is entire websites based on photography contests, contests online. And the only thing to look out for is most of them require an upfront fee. And this is a business model. It's, they're not out to do this altruistically. They want to make money by hosting these contests. And yes, they do provide actual uh, gifts and product and cash rewards but of course that's that's part of their profit the other part is money in their pocket so just have to be aware of that if you're doing contests don't put too much money into a fee to join those contests and oftentimes you want the free contests made by the big companies like uh, for example um, National Geographic they do contests quite often and finally, there's always uh, travel photography groups that you could find on Instagram or Facebook. Great question. Okay, let's see what we have here. Vivid Snaps. Sir, can you please tell me the best shutter speed for getting the snap of the water fountain? Yes, uh, make sure that you're, you're shooting only at dawn or dusk when the light is very low, unless you have an ND filter or a polarizing filter and then you can get away with shooting in the day. However, it's not easy. It's really better to shoot at low light. Go to aperture priority, lowest ISO possible, and highest F stop number possible. So if your lens is F22 or F32, then definitely go there. Adjust exposure using your exposure compensation dial and you will be all set. Follow, those, follow that and you will get some great waterfall fountain shots. If you missed that, or if anyone missed it, then I'm going to be putting this live stream on my YouTube page, and that's Mark Hemmings Photography School. And you'll be able to see that tonight, probably. So always feel free to re-watch these at Mark Hemmings Photography School on YouTube. Excellent question. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Okay. Sorry for the delay here. Scrolling is not easy on Instagram. Uh, you are not sitting in a great shadow area, which makes the iPhone struggle to expose the background versus foreground. Yes, yeah, very true. And if I had my way, <laughs> I'd be inside with a nice lit indoor home studio. But I don't have that. I have two teenagers doing schoolwork and my wife's online teaching. So I'm out here and I, and actually what would really work well is if I had a ring light, an LED light in front of me. And I should probably look into that because uh, that would be really helpful for doing these live. And then I wouldn't get the, the huge bald head uh, blown out highlights on top of me. Uh, by the way, if anyone wants to know how to fix this, if you're photographing uh, people who don't have any hair like me, it's very simple. You blast the person with front lighting. Okay, so I'm going to go th through this. It's not a question that any of you are asking currently, but it's such a great example right now. If you are stuck and you can't alter the position of the person, you can't put them in shade, and you can't do anything else, but let's just say that this is what you see is what you get, 
the more light you place on the front of the person's face, you can, of course, do it at a slight angle, maybe two lights, the less of an issue the light will be on top of their head. And the reason being is because there's a differential of light. And what that means is that I am currently in shadow because we have back and overhead lighting from the sun. This is not good. However, this is what we are given uh, at right now. So if I had a ring light that circled my iPhone as I'm recording this, what, what you would see is the iPhone would expose properly for my face and this hot spot here would actually start to disappear, almost like magic. And the more I turn up that LED ring light that circles my iPhone, the less and less this is an issue. Okay, so this may really be helpful for you all if you plan to do your own broadcasts or you're photographing someone with similar low amount of hair. So keep that in mind. Okay, great question. Thank you, Yusuf. Welcome everybody, giving you guys waves. And if you just joined, we're doing a Q&A session and feel free to ask anything you will like. And uh, we will, um, I'll just keep going for probably another 10, 15 minutes. Yusuf, uh, if your iPhone is DSLR in auto mode, if your iPhone is a DSLR in auto mode, the aperture in that scene would get bigger for some sharper image because the subject and the background are close. Okay, so Yusuf uh, brings up a good point. Let's just say that this is a DSLR uh, instead of an iPhone. And because you can see the background, that means that, the, that we have what would be called a higher f-stop number. So maybe f8, f11, f16. I would probably assume f8 because there's just a slight amount of blur back there. Not much, but just a slight amount. Now, if, if this was a DSLR and, the, and I wanted everything behind me to be blurry, then I would choose an F number that's low, like F1.8, F2.8, F4.5, or some lenses F5.6, essentially the lowest f-stop number possible. This is very good for portraiture because all of that junk in the background, except the, the, <laughs> the birdhouse, which is actually a nice birdhouse, uh, it would all be uh, out of focus. And that's really good for portraits. For landscapes, you want the opposite. You want a higher f-stop number. Now, you may have heard of terms such as wide open, closed down, uh, a fast lens, you know, all of these terms. Essentially, what they're saying is if the f-stop number is high, like f22, you have um, a lot of visibility, uh, focus sharpness, it's called, in the background. Okay. Excellent. Alessandra, welcome. Good to see you. Uh, <clears throat> Sagittarian Ashu. Hello. Joseph Corey, what is the best method to recalibrate your lens? I've tried, I haven't, tr I haven't tried the chart yet. I honestly have never done it because I'm too nervous. <laughs> uh, great question. So if anyone doesn't know what that means, um, Joseph Corey asks how to ca calibrate your lens. Uh, there's been many times in the past when my lenses and most all of you probably to a certain extent, um, you, you find that even though your, your focus is perfect, the autofocus is great, it's still, there's slight blur. And this happened to me with professional Canon gear, Canon lenses about five or six years ago. It was, I think it was the F1.2 50 millimeter that I had. It's an L, it was an L lens and it, it, uh, it just would never get focus. And I said, you know what? I am not skilled enough to even bother this, so I sent it to Canon in Toronto. And uh, Joseph, I don't, uh, I don't have any experience because I'm too nervous to do anything that is that delicate. Uh, by the way, if anyone has that problem, just that you may find that the lens needs to be recalibrated and there are ways to do it for each brand. Each company has its own way. However, often they say, they do suggest that you take it you send it to the actual um, folks who fix those, the professionals. Okay, Christine Tomasic, welcome. We're doing a Q&A session. If you have any questions, just let me know. I'm happy to help out. Uh, okay, JJSNN, welcome. Hi, guys. Any questions, just let me know. 
Okay. Okay, sorry. I already I just clicked on one I already did. Never sorry about that. Okay. Mark, uh, thanks for the digital mastery class. It's very comprehensive for a total newbie like me. Well, that's great. I really appreciate that. And um, uh, again, I, I think I mentioned this. I really want to make sure that uh, you and anyone who's taking the digital camera mastery class or any of my online courses, uh, always feel free to direct message me. And because I, I, it's critical that you guys find good value out of the courses. I don't want anyone to feel that they're, they've been left out. And if there's any concept or technical or artistic aspect that, that while you're going through the online courses that you have any problems with, then I'm here to help. Uh, okay, uh, Joseph, thanks Mark for that info. My pleasure, I'm happy to, happy to help out. By the way, um, tonight's post that I, I post both to Instagram and to Facebook is going to be using an app called LensLight. And the last five or six days I've been using Adobe Photoshop uh, Mix, and that's M-I-X. It's a really good app for doing fine artwork with your collection of collection of images on your iPhone or an Android. However, I'm going to branch out and it's going to be teaching you how to, how to get really good color fine art images by going through your collection and uh, creating some fun stuff while we are all, you know, inside. Um, and we don't have much ability to go outside. So look for that, and I'll probably upload it in about, uh, about an hour or so. And it's a Japan image. I'm going to do a lot of Japan images for the next while on this new series. So uh, if you haven't been to Japan, then come along with me on a virtual trip to the land of the rising sun. Welcome everybody. Thanks for joining all you new people. Um, what we're doing is a Q&A session and if you have any um, questions just throw them out. I'm actually switching probably more to, to a half an hour session each day. Um, I've been doing an hour session when I first started these, these Q&As which has been fun. However, I'm doing a, also juggling time with a whole bunch of other online projects as well. So uh, yeah, feel free to throw out a few more questions and then uh, we will continue this adventure tomorrow as well. Adet Teferi joined, welcome. And uh, I hope all of you are well. And thank you for the worldwide uh, um, collection of people I have here. It's always fun to know what countries you're from, especially from the beginning when you guys all come online. It's, it's really great to see. Athen Page, hey everybody, just giving you guys some waves. Thanks for joining. Um, Boris Chichava, Mark, tell us about Flash, when to use it and how. Yeah, that's a really great question. I don't use Flash unless I'm doing what's called off-camera flash. And off-camera flash is where you take the flash off your camera because it's an external flash. Also called a speed light. If anyone ever wanted to, wanted to know what the term speed light means, it's simply a fancy word for flash. And each company has their own brand of flash. Nikon, Canon, Sony, Fuji, they all have their own. They prefer that, they, that you use their own branded flash or speed light. And that's usually wise because it has good connection, uh, sort of communication, electronic communication between the two. However, of course, you can purchase what's called third-party flashes for cheaper. And if you learn to do off-camera flash, where you sync the camera with the flash with a cable or with a optical remote, then you can get some really cool images. And usually this is really good for learning how to do portraiture on the cheap. So what you would do is instead of three huge expensive studio lights, you would get three strobes, or sorry, three speed lights, three flashes. And you would set those flashes up with mini um, diffusers or homemade diffusers and you have a, a, your own very inexpensive portable studio in your own home for example and that's what I would suggest using a strobe or sorry a uh, your own flash for and that's the only time I use it well actually that's not true 
whenever I'm doing studio work, I have studio uh, strobes, those large, huge lights with huge reflect reflectors and, and softboxes. So to be honest, I don't use flash anymore. Now there is one exception. I would use flash for family photography, not, not anyone else's family, just mine, just you know, snapshots, snapshots, they're great. Fantastic to use flash for snapshots. And the only other time is if I'm doing a commercial job, event photography, where it's really low light and I really need to get those people lit. And that's the only time. So low light event photography. That's the only time I use a flash. Great question. Okay, so I'll just go to the question marks here. <clears throat> okay, Guntars, uh, how to create sun stars in landscapes? What a great question. Yeah, go to F22. Uh, by the way, if anyone wants to get those starry uh, looks with regards to the sun, simply go to a higher f-stop number. And the reason being is that the stars are formed by the shape of or the effect that is derived from the lens diaphragm. Now, the lens diaphragm is a series of usually maybe about eight uh, circular, uh, what would you call them, blades, I guess. And they're not perfectly circular, but when they open and close, they allow a certain amount of light in. It's essentially called your aperture. But these blades create a starry effect when photographing into the sun doing landscapes if you jack up that f-stop to f22 or maybe f32 if your lens will go that high. So that's what you want to do and you will get more of a starburst effect. Excellent question. Okay, for those who are just joining or just doing uh, Q&A sessions, and please feel free to pop those questions in before I, I take off. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Do you give feedback about photos uh, to your course trainees? So what I advise is, this is a good question by the way, so if you, any of you are within my Digital Camera Mastery or Lightroom Editing Mastery or Photo Shortcuts course, you're automatically in the Facebook page, I think. Well, you, you are, you're invited. And what I'll get you to do is tag me. Uh, do an at Mark Hemmings photography, that's my Facebook name, and say, at Mark Hemmings photography, what do you think of this photo? That's the, the best way because um, I, try to be, I try to be in that uh, Facebook page as much as I can just to encourage you all. And that's what, I that's what I would suggest. And by the way, if anyone doesn't know what I'm talking about with regards to the online courses, uh, you can find them at Mark. Hemmings.com. That's M-A-R-K-H-E-M-M-I-N-G-S dot com. And there's uh, four courses, online courses there to learn photography. Okay, let's see, let's see what else we have here. Uh, while accessing MF, pictures didn't get the clarity while zooming the picture, especially in night. And MF, by the way, means manual focus. Uh, especially in night with, unfortunately, um, I can't read the rest of that question because I'm not sure why, but Instagram, at least I may be doing something wrong, but Instagram's not allowing me to read the rest of your question. So, uh, my friend, if you could just finish that sentence for me and, uh, I will try to answer. Or maybe you already did. Let's see what here. While accessing MF, pictures didn't get the clarity while zooming the picture, especially in night without flash. I tried the 18 to 55 lens. Okay, here's the question. Great. Ooh. Um, it's not easy. You know, when you're at night, it's very difficult to get accurate focus. It's very hard for, for autofocus, and it's hard for manual focus. And the only thing I suggest is to buy a very powerful flashlight. Or, better yet, if you have a car nearby, ask your friend to turn on the headlights to the car to, to blast that light on the object that you're photographing. Focus on that object because it's illuminated well. And sometimes you can get away with autofocus. And uh, then you'll be all set. Now, I usually, when I'm doing landscapes in the evening or anything like that, I tend to u make use of my car headlights. If that fails, then I take a powerful flashlight. And that usually helps me to focus. Really good question. Takumi, good to see you my friend. Rich Love, welcome. 
And uh, let me just scroll here. Uh, Boris uh, Tachava, what do you think of Google Pixel smartphone for photography? What smartphone do you suggest and why? Okay, uh, I don't have any experience with Android and I don't have any experience with Google Pixel. Uh, however, if it's a new if it's a new release, my my understanding is that it's it's excellent, and I am an Apple fanboy. I currently use the uh, iPhone 11 Pro Max, which I think is quite stunning. And uh, the reason I can say that with great assurity is because I've had 23 years of photography, and I'm just trying to think of how many years of digital camera. Quite a few. I started early. And the extreme quality of the 11 Pro series from iPhone is just mind-blowing. In fact, if anyone really wants to get a, a good look at what the iPhone 11 Pro can do, what I'm going to get you to do after we finish this call or this live chat in a few minutes is I want you to scroll back in either this Instagram or my Facebook page and go through both my Mexico and my Japan photos. Every single one of those photos was, but this year, it was just a couple months ago, every single photo was an iPhone picture. <laughs> so I hope that inspires you. And by the way, I'm not outselling iPhones. You can probably get the exact same results with a really good quality Android-based phone. I don't know. I've never used any Android or Google or anything, so I'm not sure. The good news is, Boris Chachava, is that with new technology, it's very, the, the, the playing field is really leveling out because every company produces excellent stuff, excellent cameras, and it's a good time to be alive if you are a photographer. I uh, love that question, thank you. Uh, Alessandra, yes, can you please talk a little bit about photography in the rain? So what I advise if your camera is not rain resistant, for example, my Fujifilm cameras are rain resistant. I can be out in a, in a huge storm, not an issue. Uh, if, you, if that isn't the case, then what you do is you go online and your, your local camera store or your national camera store, or I guess in the end you would, you would resort to Amazon. You look for a, what's called a plastic bag camera rain protector. And it's really, quite basic. It's literally a plastic bag, but it's formed and has a little bit of Velcro to go over the front, front of your lens. And this protects your camera in the rain. And the nice thing about it is because it's crystal clear, it's just a plastic bag. You can see everything. You can press all the buttons. There's no issues and you have the protection you need. And also that little Velcro strip, strip that goes over your lens this is really helpful so that the rain doesn't seep into your lens. And it's really, it really coincides well if you have what's called a lens hood. So if your DSLR came with or you bought a lens hood, uh, that really helps. And it helps to have a UV filter on your lens just for that extra level of protection, just so that when the rain does hit your lens, it's hitting a filter and not the glass itself. So that's my, that's my suggestion. I think carrying around an umbrella is a waste of time because it means you only have one hand for the camera. So don't even bother. Just make sure you're, you're uh, dressed well for rain gear and that little plastic bag. And they're cheap too. They're not very expensive. In fact, everybody should have one of those. Great question, Alessandra. Um, Alessandra, yes, um, the, uh, the list, yeah. Uh, I, I, yesterday I put the list on my Instagram, uh, on this, uh, what would you call it, <laughs> on this live, a whole bunch of uh, links um, for the Japanese photographers that I admire. However, if it's not accessible, I'll just text it to you after this, uh, after this um, live. We'll, I'll, I'll just send it to you through a DM. Okay, let's see what else. Uh, go down to the question marks here. Amarimi, do you use the lenses to put on the iPhone? The answer is no. Um, the reason being is that I, I don't usually need telephoto when I'm doing my photography. So the majority of my photography with my iPhone is street photography and to a certain extent travel photography. And because I don't need anything greater than a 50 millimeter usually, I don't even bother using the, the clip-on lenses. 
However, I'm not saying that they're bad. In fact, if you are going to invest in those clip-on lenses, both for iPhone and Android, all, all a clip, all a clip, that may be pronounced wrong, and I apologize if it is, uh, that is probably your best bet because they've been around the longest and I think they're the biggest company and I think that the lenses are probably the best quality. It's a waste of time to buy cheap clip-on lenses for your iPhone or an Android. Don't even bother. You'll, in fact, it's a waste of money. It's better to spend more money up front on good quality glass than to skimp and buy cheap clip-on lenses because they, they'll just they just won't look good the photos will be blurry all around the perimeter okay all a clip a uh, o l l i c l i p i think or it's a o l l o c l i p maybe can someone can correct me on that or tell me which one it is i've never used them though okay let's see what else we have here okay Sorry, I just clicked on one I've already looked at. Um, cool glasses, says Boris Chichava. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, a fun fact, these have been in the family for almost 100 years, these glasses. Uh, a wonderful gift from my aunt, and they were on her shelf for ages, and they go back a long time. So I thought I would just honor the uh, ancestors by keeping them going. <laughs> um, Joseph Corey. When you have a good lens, doesn't put a UV or doesn't putting UV or skylight filter take away from the purity of the lens? Correct. Now, um, the reason I would advise using a UV or a skylight filter is, like I said, when we're out doing photos in the rain, it's critical that the UV filter is on to protect your glass. Also, if you're in a dusty environment, you definitely want to have. Even that's true that there's not so much of an opening between the glass and the and the perimeter of the lens, the front of the lens, I always advise in inclement weather that you use the IV, <laughs> the UV or skylight filter on your lens. That would be dust, that would be rain, that would be snow, that would be, um, what else? Pollution, I guess. The only time when you, you, want, to, when you want to take your UV filters off are when you're in doing studio photography, you don't need them. When you are doing landscape photography and you are in a controlled environment, you take, that, take those filters off. You want a clear, clean picture with no UV filters. Uh, what else? Fashion inside a studio. Essentially, if you are out hiking or if you're doing adventure photography, never take that UV filter off. It's critical that you keep it on because if you drop your camera, then you're out of luck. You're out of a lot of money. So great question. Essentially, what I do is if I know that my camera is not in any danger of falling and smashing on a rock, then the UV filter's off. If there's any amount of risk or inclement weather, or if I'm doing street photography, then the UV filter is on. Now, if I'm doing street photography or travel photography, why do I always have a UV filter? The reason is because I'm always walking. And for example, in my favorite, uh, my second home of San Miguel de Allende in Mexico, when I'm walking around, there's, there's cobblestones everywhere and they're uneven. You know, that's a recipe for disaster. So use a UV filter if you are unsure of the absolute safety of your lens. Great question. Okay, question mark here. Okay, uh, I'm happy to help, Alessandra. Okay, let's just see what we have here. That was a good question, by the way. Oh, I just messed up. A hundred years, you and your family are a sentimental lot. <laughs> yes, we are. Yeah, thank you for that. Mark, Module 6 onwards in D, uh, DCM, Digital Camera Mastery Online Course, are taking a long time to load. I'm wondering why. Uh, most likely, it has to do with the worldwide internet usage. Um, it has nothing to do with uh, the servers, uh, where they come from, um, because those have really powerful what would you call it, uh, bandwidth? I'm not really technically minded in that. Uh, usually it is an issue with local Wi-Fi speeds. And the reason I know this is because my Wi-Fi is crazy slow these days. And I have, uh, I have really good, what's it called, um, fiber op. 
And my guess is it's just that everybody in my neighborhood, everybody in my city is online and just, you know, taking all the bandwidth away. Now, I, I'm not technically minded. I don't know a thing about this, but I do know that uh, it is a problem that a lot of people are encountering. In fact, Netflix even throttled their... Uh, the ability for us to to view and download um, because just too many people were just online around the world. I hope that helps, but uh, it, it's not an issue with the course, uh, I assure you. Good question. Okay, um, Boris Chichava, when you visit Georgia, I will show you old city of 100 years. I would love to. I love historic areas and I'd love to get to Georgia. I appreciate that. Uh, and cool landscapes. Excellent. Uh, yeah, everybody's online because of lockdowns. It's so true. So, um, everybody, I just wanted to let you know that uh, if, um, if any of this, what I've mentioned, you wanted to come back to, I'm going to post this online. This, uh, so you can come back to it if you want. And it's going to be at Mark Hemmings Photography School, and that's on YouTube. I tried posting these on Facebook but it was such a hassle. Uh, so I, I'm only posting these on my, my YouTube page. By the way, the YouTube page has a lot of lessons on it, free photography lessons. Feel free to check them out. And uh, I'm sure you'll get a lot out of them. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to keep trying to do these every day, these live Q&A sessions for you during our lockdowns. And of course, I know that each country will have a different lockdown end time. And uh, we hope sooner than later um, however, as long as I'm locked down and I'm not going out because I'm not doing any photo shoots, then I'll still be able to spend my days um, at this time helping all of you. And then when the Eastern Canadian lockdown is done, then I'm, I'm heading out. <laughs> Too much cabin fever. Okay, so I uh, hope you all do well today. Check back tomorrow, same time and uh, have fun with your photography and also check within the hour as I'll be uploading new content to my Instagram about how to create fake lights for a fine art look within your iPhone or Android fine art photography. All the best. God bless you all. See you tomorrow.